Good morning. Today I'd like to talk about the major black organizations that will be very influential in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, during what we would call the civil rights movement. Uh, today I want to fo fo focus upon the the organizations and the individuals that were the leaders of those organizations. And maybe I'll mention some other people. And I guess in a third lecture uh, or another lecture, I will focus upon some of the major events of the civil rights movement. And hopefully we will have time to talk about the what I call the Black Revolution, although it really wasn't a, a revolution, you might want to say, a Black reform movement, but we'll save that discussion for later. Part of what will happen in the civil rights movement is that African-Americans will begin to take a different position. And what I mean by a different position, they're going to become more forceful in expressing that they wanted equality and justice and enforcement of their rights. And I'm a firm believer this is part of the strategy that may have been foreseen by someone like Booker T. Washington, that what will occur in the 1950s and the 60s could not have occurred in the 1890s and the early uh, 2000s when uh, Booker T. Washington was alive and was the dominant figure in the African-American community. Now, in terms of the uh, civil rights organization, I'm going to divide them up into two court categories. There will be the older civil rights organizations that in many ways were predominantly white. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the uh, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This is the oldest civil rights organization. This was the organization that Du Bois was uh, affiliated with and was one of the founders of the NAACP. And Du Bois will also serve as the editor of The Crisis, which was the, the, the magazine, the voice piece of the NAACP. The NAACP is going to focus upon leg legalism. And that is, the NAACP was normally not an organization that was involved early. It was not early, it was not involved in sit-ins or boycotts. The NAACP put an emphasis upon trying to bring about change through the judicial system. And I think the term that is used is legalism. So if you look at many of the court cases that will weave their way uh, through the judicial system of the United States, it will be the NAACP that will be backing these decisions. And as I said, until the 1960s, the NAACP was a prompt primarily a white organization, uh, and uh, it was founded by mainly whites, uh, and even individuals, and I'm saying individuals like Du Bois, and uh, they were in the minority in the NAACP. And then that after the 1960s, the NAACP will become a predominantly black group, which it is now. The leader of the NAACP in the 1960s, there is a road in Louisville or Jefferson County named after that individual, and that would be Roy Wilkins. So Roy Wilkins, when you see Roy Wilkins Drive or Road, whatever it is in Louisville, it is named after uh, Roy Wilkins, who was the leader of the NAACP in the 1960s. A second, uh, one of the second oldest civil rights organizations is was the National Urban League, which also still exists. Uh, and I know there is a chapter or a branch, I'm not sure what they call it, that's in Louisville right now, the National Urban League. And the National Urban League focused upon helping African Americans uh, adjust to life in the urban areas. Uh, the uh, Urban League will help with job training, will help with education. Uh, the focus was upon uh, also uh, residential, getting Afri housings for African Americans. And it will be very dependent upon financial support from whites. Uh, quite often they will be Jewish. And uh, so with the NAACP then, it will mainly be helping African Americans in the North. But the financial support 
uh, up, um, up to the 1960s will primarily be from, from whites. So it's helped African Americans. Financial support will be coming from the whites. Uh, and that's still very true probably for the, the National Urban League because it needs grants and uh, fundraising to, to, do its, to do its mission. But I would think now the majority of the members are probably uh, African Americans. The leader of the uh, Urban League during this time period, the Civil Rights era, was the Kentuckian. And someone that, uh, that uh, probably came to Louisville quite frequently because he, he lived, he was raised, and he lived in Shelby County. And uh, his name was Whitney Young Jr. And he was raised at Lincoln Institute, which is in Shelby County uh, in the, near the community of Simpsonville. I won't go into the entire history of Lincoln Institute, but it was a school created, a school, uh, created by Berea College after the day law was passed in Kentucky. Uh, and it was created in 190. The first class, the, the, they built the corner, put the cornerstone down, and I think it was 1911. And Lincoln Institute existed from 1911 to 1966, and it will be an all black school, uh, basically a residential uh, high school for black students in the state of Kentucky. And you can still see the buildings uh, on. I-64, the Lincoln Institute is, uh, is located near the University of Louisville golf course. And in the winter and the fall, you can see uh, the primary building, which is uh, Berea Hall. The campus is used for the Whitney Young Job Corps Center right now. And so the leader of the Urban League during the 1960s was Whitney Young Jr. And he, like I said, he was he was raised on that campus, and he was a graduate of KSU, and he will be a primary figure during the civil rights movement, and considered one of the, the big six uh, civil rights leaders. The third oldest uh, organization would be CORE. CORE was a primarily, CORE is the Congress of Racial Equality, your core was a primarily a biracial organization, blacks and whites. It will its focus uh, and before the 1960s was up on was in the north, and uh, core will use boycotts and sit-ins to bring about change uh, in the northern areas. Um, so it did not really attract the. Uh, African Americans in the South, that won't come until later. But the, the, the leader of CORE during the Civil Rights Movement, his name was James Farmer. So he would be one of the big six civil rights leaders. Um, and the, the fourth one that I put and that would consider as part of the big six civil rights leaders, which is the National Council of Negro Women. And the National Council of Negro Women, that still exists. I know there's a chapter in uh, uh, Louisville because uh, they had a meeting not too long ago at Lincoln Institute. The National Council of Negro Women uh, had, was created by uh, Mary McLeod Bethune in 1935. Remember, Mary McLeod Bethune was the founder of of a uh, they, uh, Bethune Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, I asked you to read her last will and testament. Uh, the primary leader of the uh, National Council of Negro Women would be Dorothy Hyatt, Dr. Dorothy Hyatt. Dr. Dorothy Hyatt. She will be the leader of their organization for over 50 years. Uh, she's deceased now, but I think she lived to be about 100 or 101. Uh, and the focus of the uh, National Council of Negro Women was to help women or to empower African-American women, uh, their families, and their communities, uh, help them to work together and help them to, to, to be strengthened and to, to be stronger. And once you would have to say then that would be its focus. I guess you could also say it probably would be somewhat conservative. Uh, if you look at the composition of the members at that time, 
um, and probably the members I've seen now, they'd be probably older African-American uh, women. Uh, they're going to be probably a little more conservative in terms of dress and attitudes and so forth. But the important thing is that the National Council of Negro Women was there during the Civil Rights Movement, and Dr. Height did speak at the March on Washington in 1963, uh, where everybody, of course, remembers the, the speech by Dr. King of I Have a Dream. What will happen after the 19, really after 1960, and the student protests uh, began February, it's like February the 1st, uh, 1960, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then it spread to other cities in the South, uh, such as uh, Nashville. And is that the black organizations, the organization, civil rights organization that came into existence after 1960, they tended to be black. Uh, and there was black leadership from the beginning. The composition was overwhelmingly black. Yes, there will be white allies, but it was almost like black people began to not only began to not only did they compose the majority of these organizations, but they took on the leadership of these organizations. The first one I want to mention is SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and sometimes the acronym that you see for SNCC is S N C C. And sometimes I've also seen it as S-N-I-C-K. But most of the time it's S-N-C-C, NAS Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Dr. King will play a major role in getting and starting this organization. And the person that he will give the major responsibility to for the leadership of, the, uh, of SNCC will be Ella Baker. And she's a person that we don't talk about enough about in uh, history, in American history, she will be crucial uh, with the formation of SNCC. And of course, at the time of the uh, March on Washington in 1963, the leader of SNCC will be John Lewis. And it's interesting, if you go read the history of John Lewis and his speech, uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy was really upset with his speech because he was afraid uh, that it was, well, it was very controversial in the words of Kennedy. But uh, you go back and read it now, it seems so mild mannered. But my point is, SNCC will be black, basically black college students. Many of them will, of course, be affiliated with HBCUs because at that time, overwhelming majority of African Americans who went to college, and especially in the South, they would be at HBCUs. And so SNCC was established to help give them some organization. And of course, with the organization, it's going to come training and so forth. And the other primary organization would be the SCLC the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And of course, the, the founder and the leader of the SCLC will be uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And with the SCLC, we're compared to the NAACP. The NAACP focuses upon uh, legalism, going through the court system, which means if there was going to be change, it was going to be gradual because you'd have to go all the way through the court system. And, you know, sometimes cases end up in the Supreme Court and then sometimes they get to the Supreme Court and the court decides that it doesn't want to deal with it. So you might get change, but it's going to take years. When you're talking about SCLC and as you're talking about SNCC, they want to change. Uh, I, there was a phrase of the 1960s. What do you? What do we want? We want freedom. When do you want it? We want freedom now. And so SCLC work with SNCC um, until well, initially they will work with SNCC. Uh, the focus will be upon using uh, tactics such as sit-ins. Uh, boycotts um, and the key, key would be 
nonviolently, nonviolently. So those were the primary big, I would consider big six civil rights organizations, and those were the primary leaders. There's no doubt during this uh, time period, one person that, uh, that gets lost in history that you should remember also is A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was the leader of the uh, brother, uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Now, probably the younger members in the class don't know what a sleeping car porter was, but for a long time, the major mode of transportation was the passenger train. And a sleeping car porter would be someone that would help passengers uh, put the luggage, take the, put the luggage on, take the luggage off, uh, there would be sleeping cars on many of the pass on, on many of the trains. They would take care of them. It'd be like a maid or a butler on the trains. And um, primarily, the overwhelming majority of these individuals who were sleeping car porters were African Americans. And A. Philip Randolph will help them to form a union to try and get better working uh, conditions, to get better pay, to get better treatment. Uh, a. Philip Randolph was uh, the person who first came up with the idea of a march on Washington. And that was in the 1940s. And because of his threat to, <clears throat> to, to create a march on Washington during the, in the 1940s when America was at war, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will create and have work with Congress to pass some legislation. Uh, minor legislation, as we look back upon it, to keep the March in Washington from occurring. And then this legislation will create a Fair Employment Practices Commission to make sure when it comes to giving awarding contracts uh, for the work with the federal government, that supposedly uh, African Americans were, were going to be treated fairly. But the bottom line is that Randolph, the leader of the sleeping car porters proposed a march in Washington, which did not occur. 1963, A. Philip Randolph was there again. He was also in the room where these decisions were being made to have the uh, march on Washington. And this time it will occur. And I want you to understand it, you know, looking back now, it's so interesting that we, we talk about the greatness of the March in Washington and everybody remembers the I have a dream speech. There was fear in Washington, fear in Washington, D.C. What was going to happen when you brought all of those black people together? And was there going to be violence and everything? Sounds very similar to what has occurred in 2021. And go look at the historical record. No violence. I think over 100,000 people there, primarily black. Uh, Kennedy had been worried, but now it turns out to be one of the major events in, uh, in American history. So A. Philip Randolph is somebody you should remember. Another person that's very important in the civil rights movement, with civil rights movement, and he was on the periphery. And the reason he was on the periphery had to deal with his sexual orientation. And that, that person would be Bayard Rustin, B-A-Y-A-R-D, Rustin, R-U-S-T-I-N. Now, Rustin was a close associate of Dr. King. Now, you will see pictures of Rustin with King and... Uh, you know, Andy Young and other members of SCLC, but you will not see a, not, a lot of them. And the reason you will not see a lot of them is because African Americans at that time is almost like they could not afford to have anyone to say that they were communists. They could not afford, like a, when we talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, that they were a woman, that they had a child out of wedlock, uh, all of those things will be held against him. Bayard Rustin was openly gay. And King and uh, the other uh, African-Americans who were leaders 
they, they knew that that information would be used against them and used against the civil rights movement by the segregationists. Now, we also know that a King was a was King and with SCLC, many of the individuals in that organization were Baptist ministers. And there's no doubt at that time, and it probably still is true, and many of the Baptist church, black Baptists, have issues with homosexuality and are definitely against it. So not only would I think the 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 influence of Rustin have to be limited because of the fear of how white segregationists would respond, I think it had to be also be limited because of the fear of how African Americans would respond. Because I'm gonna say this, not all black people were supporters of Martin Luther King Jr. I want that understood. You've got to remember uh, that the FBI will have African Americans infiltrate not just uh, the Black Panthers, as the newest movie has come out that, that demonstrates uh, in, in the, uh, that they that they infiltrated the Black Panthers, but they will use spies against King. And some of the individuals who will be used as spies against King will be black ministers. Okay, so I know we have this idea that uh, that there was unanimous support of Martin Luther King Jr., but that is definitely not true. So those now there were other the other individuals you should remember: Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, and her stand uh, in. 1964 at the Democratic Convention, and Fannie Lou Hamer was, I would you guess you want to say ordinary person, sharecropper, Mississippi, had been raped, uh, had been doctors had uh, performed unauthorized surgery upon her, had been beaten, but yet she still stood, and you know her famous phrase is that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you need to know about people like, know about, uh, know about Fannie Lou Hamer, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is that the Civil Rights Movement was an organized effort by, by Black Americans to end racial discrimination and gain equal rights under the law. Now, you can still make an argument that of course, with the organization like the NAACP, which came into existence, I think it was in 1910, because of events that happened in Frank Springfield, Illinois, that it began to pick up momentum in the late 1940s and all the way to the late 1960s. And usually we say the end of the civil rights movement is 1968. And that is partly with the assassination of Dr. King, and then the movement changes. Now, some people would say, well, Mr. Baskin, why didn't you mention Malcolm X? Uh, because I hadn't mentioned Malcolm X, but I will mention Malcolm X because he was not per se a civil rights leader. Remember at that time that when Malcolm was assassinated in 1965, you know, in Harlem, and Malcolm, received his first notoriety when he was a member of the Nation of Islam. And the Nation of Islam is a is an, a religion, is a religion. Uh, it has been verified by the Supreme Court of the United States. It's part of the reason, remember with Muhammad Ali, he was a member of the Nation of Islam. He refused to uh, be drafted. He refused to serve in the military. He gave up the the heavyweight crown. He uh, he uh, and the and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that the Nation of Islam is an official religion. And so people may not like what they believe, but it has as much validity as being Baptist, Methodist, or whatever else. It is an official. It is an it is a religion. And. Malcolm was not necessarily, especially when he was a member of the Nation of Islam, a quote-unquote civil rights leader. Uh, because I think anything when you talk about uh, Malcolm at this point, the Nation of Islam was a, more of a separatist organization. And, and I think even now, uh, some of you may know individuals in Louisville who are members of the Nation of Islam. And the Nation of Islam does preach 
separation. Now, I want to preach, they do, they, it is a religion, but it does preach separation. And so I'm not calling it, as most, most scholars wouldn't call it a civil rights organization. But the Nation of Islam was important because in one of uh, Malcolm's most famous speeches, it will be the ballot or the bullet. America had a choice. Either you could deal with King, or you're going to have to King, King and nonviolence and, and direct action and love, or America was going to have to deal with a, a, another group of African Americans who were more radical, the ballot or the bullet. And so I'm not, sh I wouldn't, the reason I'm not considering the Nation of Islam a civil rights organization because at that time the Nation of Islam was not fighting for desegregation and it was not fighting for integration. I'm not really sure that it does now. Uh, it's more of an organization that given the, the choice, the Nation of Islam would want separation between blacks and whites. And of course with Malcolm, I would say to you, remember Malcolm changes views after he is forced out of the Nation of Islam. Uh, and especially after he goes to Mecca. And there he goes to Mecca and he see, will see Muslims who were light-skinned Muslims who had blue blue eyes, Muslims who had blonde hair. So it's almost like sometimes it's you could say Malcolm goes one way and King goes the other. And I, I would always say to you when you're studying individuals, Remember, people change. People change. And so I'm saying the Malcolm of the 1961 to 62, that when white America first heard about the Nation of Islam, will not be the Malcolm of 1965 when he was assassinated. Okay? The King of 1963, when he talked about, I have a dream, will not be the king of 1968 when he was assassinated. They changed views. It was true for Du Bois. I'm not sure if it was true for Washington, but it was definitely true for Du Bois. Du Bois went through a lot of changes. All right, so the movement was mainly nonviolent. It was nonviolent on the part of the African Americans. But I want, I want you to understand that the civil rights movement, part of the reason it worked, it was successful, is one, is because the segregationists were violent. People like Bull Connors in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. The king understood, he understood the importance of a TV for the nation to see the brutality of the segregationists and individuals like Bull Connors and what happened in Selma, Selma and what happened in Mississippi with the three boys uh, that, uh, that were killed and what will happen with the Freedom Riders and I'll talk about those more in another lecture. lecture. Those things were important because now with TV and what was happening in the rest of the world African nations were gaining their freedom. The United States was in a battle be with Russia for dominance in the world. It was crucial that the movement was nonviolent and it will result in laws to protect the constitutional rights of Americans regar regardless of their color, their race, their sex or their national origin. So I want you to understand that you can make a strong argument. The sacrifices of African Americans in the civil rights movement will lead to progress for sex, to our gender, okay? And I think the Supreme Court has expand, expanded that recently that when we say sex or gender, we're also talking about sexual orientation, national origin, race, color. So the African Americans are going to lead the way to more groups in America being able to exercise their constitutional rights. Okay? 
Now, I've already talked about in another lecture, Harry Truman issuing the executive order to end desegregation in the armed forces. And I've also, and I'm going to repeat about 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which was a consolidation of five cases into one, where the Supreme Court is going to decide that separate but equal was inherently unequal, and where the Supreme Court is going to end racial segregation in public schools. Now that will be a brutal process. It will be a brutal process. And many people in my generation can tell you about how brutal it was. Let me give you one example. Uh, a few years ago, I did an oral history interview with uh, some African Americans who were the first individuals to desegregate Maribel High School in Maribel, Tennessee. It's, it was a rival of my the high school from which I graduated from. There were five African Americans, which would be the first ones to, to desegregate Maribel High School. One of the individuals told me, and he said this more than one time, that uh, after he graduated from Maribel High School, he went into the military and got his, he also got his college degrees you know, bachelor's and his master's, and he became a mental health counselor. And he made a statement that stunned me, but now I think about it, especially as I see pictures of these, these children, these children who were going to school who had, had to go to school with the protection of the National Guard and the military and these white mobs that were screaming and hollering at them. And he talked about you know, where he went in Maryville High School, there was no overt violence. You don't, you, there was no National Guard there to protect them. But he did say there were things that happened every day at that school that did not make it in the newspapers. And he said the best training for surviving Vietnam and what he had to go through mentally was what happened in Maryville High School during that one year, that last year, that he was a senior there. And I was stunned and I thought, the first time he said it, wow. And he has always continued to say it. And the other African-Americans who are with him at that time have said the same thing. They went through this things that did not make it through the newspapers. And you will quite often find that many of those African-Americans who were the first ones to desegregate those schools they are only now beginning to talk about it because they were traumatized. What PTSD, they were traumatized. And I want you to think about what the price that was paid. So, um, Brown versus Board of Education was started the process of desegregating schools. 1955, the Supreme Court will come back and talk about doing it with all deliberate speed, whatever that meant. And one of the uh, one one final thing that where I stop today is sometimes I think in, in history you have to remember that our deaths will have more impact than what we do living. Like with George Floyd, I think his death and how he died has affected America much more than George Floyd, the person who was living. August twenty eighth, nineteen fifty five. Emmett Till, a 14-year-old from Chicago, was brutally murdered in Mississippi for allegedly flirting with a white woman. His murderers, that would be uh, the woman's wife, and I think it was uh, another white man that were involved. Yes, they did have a trial. They were acquitted. They were ac acquitted and Eventually, they were paid by a magazine to tell their story. Guess what? They told the story and they, they told what they did and why they did it. And, of course, they couldn't be tried again. But, you know, at that time, for a black person, uh, for a white person to be tried for killing a black person normally meant that there was that no matter what the white person was not going to be convicted. And in this case, it was, they were not convicted, even though there was only one eyewitness, and this eyewitness was a black man, uh, Emmett Till's uncle. And he stood up and said, there, 
there he is. They asked him, uh, who killed his nephew? And he, he stood up and said, there he is. Okay. And my point is he identified them. But yet, I think within less than an hour, the all-white jury found them not guilty. And But, as I said, a few months later, they came along and accepted money from a newspaper, or no, from a magazine. And they told everything that happened, and there's no doubt that they did it. And the white woman, I think she's still alive, who made this claim that he flirted with her. And by what you understand... Because he flirted with her in her, is what she allegedly said. That means that it was right to take the, man, the life of a 14-year-old. And part of the reason that this, the death of Emmett Till received so much publicity is a decision that his mother made. And his mother decided that he was going to have an open casket funeral open casket because she wanted the world to see what they did to her son and this picture of, of Emmett Till uh, lying laying in the casket uh, was published in Jet Magazine and some of you may not know Jet Magazine but they used to be Jet and they used to be Ebony and they were published by the Johnson family, African Americans. And I think both, both of the publications have gone out of existence now. Um, in fact, I think some of the, the uh, what is it, something, the copyrights are, uh, for them have been sold. Um, and I, I've forgotten who's bought the, uh, um, who's bought the material for, for the, those publications. But that, that's irrelevant what we're talking about. Publishing that picture helped the world to see what could happen to a black person in Mississippi. Okay, So I want you to think about sometimes in terms of our lives, what happens after we die may have more influence than what will happen while we are alive. And Emmett Till was just a 14-year-old from Chicago who would go every summer to Mississippi. And one particular day, he may or may not have flirted with an older white woman. And as a result, he was killed. That happened quite frequently in Mississippi. To, for black people to be killed in Mississippi, that was normal. That was normal. What changed was when his mother made the decision for that he would have an open casket funeral. And that picture was published in Jet Magazine. And the world got to see the brutality that African Americans faced in the South on a daily basis. All right? We'll stop with that stop at that point. And the next lecture we'll pick up and talk about some more major uh, I guess you could say civil rights movement uh in a timeline of the civil rights movement. All right, so we've talked about the major organizations, some of the major leaders, some of the individuals that are involved. And remember, there is no way we can go over everyone who had a role in the civil rights movement. But you got, just remember this, the civil rights movement will be everyday, average, ordinary, black people who decided they just weren't going to take it anymore. All right? All right. Thank you. Bye.